you have your Bibles, open up to the book of Daniel. It's an Old Testament book. You go past the Psalms, get past Ezekiel, and you have Daniel. If you've gotten to Hosea, you've gone too far. As Rod said, we do feel uh, a pressing need to go through this, this book, uh, so we pray that it would be beneficial. We know it, it, we know it will be because it's God's word but we especially pray that it would be beneficial to you in whatever current circumstances you're going through. So open up Daniel chapter one. That's where we're gonna spend our time this morning. Before we go there though, I'm gonna pray and ask God for help. Father, you know our needs. You know the challenges that we face individually. You know the challenges that we face uh, corporately. And so we pray, Father, that you would speak to us through your word, that you would give us ears to hear what you want to say to us, that you would strengthen our faith, that we would have a greater understanding of your sovereignty over all things, all circumstances, all kings, all nations, every political event, every, every world war. Father, you're sovereign over everything. Nothing is outside of your control. Help us to believe that by faith. We pray this in Christ's name, amen. Well, if you turn on the news, which you should do sparingly, unless you want to be depressed, the world seems to be going uh, crazy. You look across the globe, you see wars and rumors of wars. You see global economic crises. Terrorist activity seems to abound. Even Christians are being persecuted uh, and martyred for the faith. If you look here, domestically in America, we face our own challenges, riots in the streets, school shootings, racial tensions, politicians who have no fear of God whatsoever, utter confusion regarding gender and sexuality, the celebration of abortion and death, Christian business owners being sued for holding to basic Christian convictions, even churches becoming targets of violence. In the face of such turbulence, the temptation for Christians, the temptation for the church is to fear and to panic. For some, the temptation is to even compromise, that there would be less friction between them and the prevailing culture. Because of these temptations, as Rod said earlier, we believe it is necessary for us to go through the book of Daniel, because Daniel speaks to these realities. Though the book was written 2,600 years ago, it has particular pertinent relevance for our lives today. The book of Daniel is about the sovereignty of God over all human affairs, everything, over kings and kingdoms, over wars, over evil plans. God's sovereign over everything. The book of Daniel is about the eternality of God's kingdom as opposed to the temporary nature of all earthly kingdoms. That is, as kingdoms rise and as kingdoms fall, God's kingdom remains forever. The book of Daniel is a book for people who are wondering how to be faithful in a land that is increasingly hostile to the faith. It's intended to help ground us as God's people in the truth that regardless of what's going on in the world, in our lives, in our nation, that nothing at all can thwart God's purpose and God's agenda, what he has set out to do in this world. It's intended to give us a holy resolve to remain faithful, regardless of whatever consequences, whatever pressures might come at us, whether it be individually or as a church all together, that God really can prosper the church, and we really can thrive even in times of economic or political or uh, personal physical crisis. So the title of our message today is Living with Holy Resolve. Living with Holy Resolve. I believe that's what, I think that could be a theme for the whole book of Daniel. It's especially a theme for our message today. If we're to do this, if we're to live with holy resolve, we first must understand that the culture we inhabit is not neutral, that the world, the world system in which we live is not neutral, that there is a war going on for your mind and for your heart, 
And if you're not careful, you can uncritically adopt the prevailing ideas of culture that would seek to oppose God in his kingdom. And so if you are to live with holy resolve, the first thing you must do is recognize the world's indoctrination program. Recognize the world's indoctrination program. Let's look at Daniel 1, verses 1 to 7. The book opens up. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. Then the king commanded Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility, youths without blemish, of good appearance and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace, and to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. Chaldeans is another word for Babylonians. The king assigned to them a daily portion of the food that the king ate and of the wine that he drank. They were to be educated for three years, and at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. Among these were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. And the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. Daniel he called Belteshazzar, Hananiah he called Shadrach, Mishael he called Meshach, and Azariah he called Abednego. Before we even jump into uh, the, the main part of our passage today, we need to understand a little bit of the context that this book opens up with. So the year is uh, 605 BC. Uh, 605 BC, Babylon is the prevailing dominant world power. Uh, the kingdom of Israel has already fallen. There is no more Israel at this point in, in history. There is only the kingdom of Judah. This is about 400 years after the reign of King David, where you had a united monarchy, uh, all 12 tribes of, of, of God's people united together under King David, then under King Solomon. After Solomon uh, died, the kingdom split. There was a civil war. The, the, the kingdom in the north was called Israel. The kingdom in the south is called Judah. And for the next 300 years or so, you've got both of these nations in significant decline because they had horrible leadership. They had horrible kings. The kingdom of the north, the, uh, Israel, never had a good king. All evil kings, all the time, only. The kingdom of Judah is outlasting the kingdom of Israel because it had a few good kings in uh, leadership. And so here at this point where, where our book opens up, Judah has become nothing more than a vassal state. They're, they're like a puppet nation with a puppet king. Jehoiakim does not have any real authority over his people because he is a vassal of King Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar comes to, to Judah and says, hey, if you don't want to die, uh, pay us taxes. And Jehoiakim says, all right, I'll do that. Well, soon after, Jehoiakim decides he doesn't want to do that. He doesn't want to give money. He doesn't want to give tribute. And so King Nebuchadnezzar is going to come, the, the, the nation of Babylon is going to come and surround Judah particularly surround Jerusalem where the temple of God was and where the, it would have been the central uh, site of religious, political, economic uh, prosperity there in uh, Jerusalem. And so that's where our passage opens up today. We have Judah is being surrounded. It's being besieged. You've got the temple of God being plundered. Goods are taken from it and they're being taken back to uh, Babylon and even we'll see a group of Jewish nobility are going to be taken captive and deported to Babylon. It'll be another 20 years before the nation of Babylon actually falls. It has not fallen, or before the nation of Judah actually falls. It has not fallen yet. There are three waves of deportations that happened during this time of political crisis. Our events for this book and for this, for this day in particular are focused on the first deportation to Babylon. As you think about that, I just want you, I want you to put yourself in the shoes of these people. Here it is, you're, you're God's chosen people. You were, you were promised a land to dwell in, a, a, an everlasting possession. 
a place where a, a land that would flow with milk and honey, a place where you would have rest from your enemies. And now all of a sudden you're being plucked out of your homeland. And this is different from if you and I were to be deported from America. God didn't promise America to us. God promised Israel to these people. And they're, be, they're being plucked out of their homeland and being deported to a strange land, a foreign land, a land that they don't recognize, a land full of foreign gods and foreign images and foreign idols. This would have been devastating for the people of God. From a human perspective, it looks like Babylon, it looks like King Nebuchadnezzar is in complete control. I mean, even as he, he takes uh, trophies from the house of God and puts them in the house of his gods, he's essentially saying, my gods are better than yours. My gods win. You could think of 1 Samuel 5 when the Ark of the Covenant is taken out of uh, Jerusalem and it's taken t- into, sorry, not, not, it's not taken out of Jerusalem, it's taken out of Israel and it's taken into the land of uh, Philistia and put right in the temple of Dagon, showing Dagon wins, Dagon beat Yahweh. Well, that's what's happening here. All these vessels from the temple are being carried off into captivity, showing our gods, the Babylonian gods, win. And so the question the people of God are asking is this, is God really in control? Is God really in control? Does Babylon really win? Is King Nebuchadnezzar really in charge? How could this happen to us? From a biblical perspective, we see that God was in complete control. Look at verse two. This is important. This this phrase will show up three times in this chapter. Verse two, the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar. The Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar. You see, from the outset, what what the prophet Daniel is trying to convey in this whole book is that nothing is happening that is is outside of God's control. Nothing is happening outside of God's sovereign hand in these circumstances. You think of what Jesus says to Pilate in John 19, 11. You would, you would have no authority over me unless it, it had been given to you by my Father in heaven. The reason God's people had been carried off into captivity, the reason that Babylon was coming against this, this nation of Judah is because God's people had completely turned to idolatry. They thought they could have the best of world, both worlds. We'll, we'll serve Yahweh, yes, but we'll also serve Baal and we'll serve Asherah and we'll bow down to them as well, as well. And so this should not have caught the people of God by surprise. This, this idea that the Chaldeans would come against the, the people of God if they uh, didn't repent was all through the prophets. Read the prophet Jeremiah. Read about uh, what Isaiah says. All, all, all these people are saying that the Babylonians are going to come. Habakkuk says, uh, God tells them specifically, I'm raising up the Chaldeans against you. Jeremiah says, the king of the north is going to come against you, and he is going to lay siege to your cities. And yet you've got false prophets in Judah saying, no, no, no. That's a conspiracy. Don't listen to Jeremiah. Nobody likes him anyway. And God says, you better listen to these prophets because judgment is coming. Here's what he said to King Hezekiah. King Hezekiah was actually a good king. Isaiah 39, 6 and 7. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and that which your fathers have stored up to this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. And some of your own sons who will come from you, whom you will father, shall be taken away, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Those very things predicted a hundred years before happened in Daniel chapter one. The royal family, the nobility, these young men are taken off into captivity. We see in verse six, there are a few men named Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. If you've ever watched Veggie Tales, better known as Rack, Shack, and Benny. These young men are probably young teenagers, right? Some, some of you young men in our, in our church, probably just like you, 13, 14, 15 years old, right? Plucked out of their homeland, plucked away from everything that they had ever known. So you ask the question, why would, why would Nebuchadnezzar take these, 
young men all the way into Babylon. What, what's the point? Well, verse 4 gives us the indication. The goal is that these young men are going to serve in the court of the king. They're going to be White House interns, you could say. They're going to be the future political officials of, of the land of Babylon. From a military and political perspective, this is a really, really smart strategy. You're taking the cream of the crop from Israel. You're taking the future leaders of Israel. You're taking the best of the best, the valedictorians, the star athletes, those who are skilled in all different kinds of things, and you're saying, come be a part of our kingdom. In doing this, you're both weakening the, the regime of Judah, and you're strengthening your own. But if these young men are to serve the king of Babylon, first, they will have to be schooled in the ways of Babylon. And so, the indoctrination begins. These young men are enrolled into the college of the Chaldeans. They're fast-tracked on a three-year degree. All expenses paid. Every, uh, every uh, expense that you need, don't have to worry about it. No student debt with this uh, college degree. You get it all. You get, the best, you get the best wisdom that Babylon has to offer you. You get the best food. You get the best meals that Babylon has to offer you. You don't need a meal plan. You're not eating ramen noodles. You're not eating Pop-Tarts to survive in this college. You're eating the best of the best of the king's table, the daily portion of food from the king's table. These young men are taught the language of the Chaldeans, which was Aramaic. That, uh, that language actually held over all the way to Jesus' day. Jesus spoke in Aramaic. They're taught the literature of the Chaldeans. They're taught the history of Babylon. They're, <clears throat> they're taught Babylonian greatness, that this is how Babylon came to power. This is how Babylon <clears throat> has taken over the... <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm going to have to get a drink. This is how Babylon has taken over the known world. They're taught the religion of Babylon, how the gods had created the world, specifically how the god Marduk brought this world into existence and then planted Babylon, this center of human ingenuity right there on the, on the world for all to see its greatness. That's what they would have been taught. They would have been taught the arts and the sciences of Babylon. They would have been taught how to look at the stars and the constellations, to read the horoscopes, to determine the will of the gods. They would have been taught how to interpret dreams. They would have been taught the practice of divination, understanding the will of God through dark arts. All of these things are happening in, in this college of the Chaldeans. And the intent is to deprogram these young men out of devotion to Yahweh, to, to, to rid their mind of any vestiges of loyalty and devotion to Yahweh and reprogram them to understand that Babylon provides for you. King Nebuchadnezzar provides for you. The world will pro provide for you. You do, you do not need God. The goal is for these young men to assimilate, to fit right in to Babylon. Think like a Babylonian. Speak like a Babylonian. Be a Babylonian. Everything around these young men was intended to train them in the ways of Babylon. As they walked the streets each day, as they looked at the artwork, the statues, the images, the temples, everything is screaming at them, Babylon is great and your God is not. The final step of this indoctrination was to give these young men new names. Out with your old Hebrew names and in with your new Babylonian names. Here in America, we often pick names just because of personal preference. There may be at times uh, familial ties. That was not the case with Hebrews. In, in Hebrew naming, your name and your identity are, are uniquely bound together. Your name represents something about your beliefs, who you are, who you will be. And so for these young men, losing their Hebrew names was this, as if the foundation of their whole existence was crumbling under them. Names that once honored God, the God of Israel, are replaced with names that honored the gods of Babylon. A couple of examples. Daniel, Danny L, means God is my judge. He's given a new name, Belteshazzar. May Bel it's a Babylonian God. May Bel protect my life. That's his new name. 
do you understand for him, this is blasphemous to be given this name, to be, that name to be placed on him. It, it, it has to be so uniquely horrifying. But that's his new name. That's what he's called in Babylon. Azariah means God has helped me. Yahweh has helped me. Well, he's given the name Abednego, which means servant of Nabu, another Babylonian god. These young men are given new names. They're, they're being filled with new ideas, new identities. Everything around them is just, it's utter confusion at this point. So we ask ourselves, what, is, what does this mean for us today? How, how do we apply this to our lives? Although you and I don't understand what it's like to be taken <clears throat> as a prisoner of war, we don't understand what it's like, uh, most of us, to be exiled from our homeland the Bible does indeed refer to Christians, though, as exiles in a strange land. Look at 1 Peter 2, verse 11. <clears throat> Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Peter calls Christians sojourners and exiles, exiles in a land that is not their own. We, as God's people, are exiles living in Babylon. And make no mistake, make no mistake, we can be thankful for America, but America is not Israel. America is Babylon, along with every other nation in the world. The church is the fulfillment of Israel, not America. So we're exiles living in the land of Babylon. And it's, it's crucial that we understand that there is a concerted effort by this entire world system that we inhabit to indoctrinate us and to assimilate us into the ideas and the practices of Babylon. The scripture is clear that there is indeed a pattern of this world, a flow of this world, a course in which this world is walking. Look at Ephesians 2, 1 and 2. Paul says, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world. That's what you used to do, he said. You followed the course of this world. There is a, there's a pattern here. You're following, it's not just that you're following the course of this world. Its leader is the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 tells us, do not be conformed. The NIV says, to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. In other words, don't let the king of Babylon shape your worldview. Don't let that happen. Your worldview needs to be constantly shaped and built on the unchanging, authoritative, sufficient word of God. And that alone, often we're unaware of the patterns of the world that shape us. There's a, a story that David Foster Wallace tells. He says, there's, there's two young fish uh, swimming along one day in the water. And uh, they come across an older fish coming the other direction. And he nods and he says, morning, boys, how's the water? And the, the two young fish, they nod back at him and, and they keep swim, swimming along and until one kind of looks at the other one, he says, what in the world's water? Right? They, they don't even know they're swimming in it. They, they, they're just in these, this stream that, that's life as they know it. For us, there is water that we swim in culturally. There is a cultural river that is flowing and going, and oftentimes we might not even be aware of the ways in which it's shaping us. So what is the water that we swim in today? I could say a lot of things right here. I'll give a few things. The water that we swim in in America is expressive individualism. Expressive individualism, which means that meaning comes not from God, meaning comes from within. If you've ever heard the term, follow your heart, you do you, be who you want to be, do what you want to do, and nobody can tell you any different, that is expressive individualism, and it is not of God. This idea of personal autonomy, I can do what, what, I, can do what I want, it's my body, it's my choice, I, nobody can tell me what to do, that's expressive individualism. 
The water that we swim in, the stream that we swim in in America is that of religious pluralism. The idea that there are many paths to God and you would be bigoted. You would be a bigot to tell anybody that there's only one way to God. There's no exclusive truth claims that you could make. The water that we swim in culturally is that of consumerism. Get all you can get while the getting's good. Live it up. You get one life, make the most of it, take as much as you can for yourself. It does not matter what other people think. It does not matter who is harmed in the process. The movies you watch, the books you read, the music you listen to, the news you consume, the corporate trainings that you have to participate in at work, the people you surround yourself with, all of these things have a shaping effect in your life and in your world view. They are indeed discipling you. They're either conforming you to the image of Christ, they're making you a citizen of heaven, or they're conforming you to the image of of you could say your King Nebuchadnezzar. They're conforming you in the ways of Babylon. Should we therefore retreat from the world to our holy huddles? No, that's not what the book of Daniel tells us at all. Nor should we be angry culture warriors. Daniel gives us the model of faithful presence in a hostile culture, to be in the world, but not of it. And so I'm not saying, don't hear me saying that exposure to ideas is a bad thing. In fact, I would say we as Christians should be willing to be exposed to any ideas because we know that God has truth. We don't have to be scared of of other ideas. And sometimes exposing Christians to ideas in the confine of a healthy community rather than say a college classroom where uh, the professor's out to really shape your worldview, it could be better in context of Church. So exposure to false ideas is not a bad thing. However, you must learn to filter every single idea, every single philosophy you've ever heard through the word of God. You have to. If you do not do that, you will uncritically adopt the prevailing ideas and worldview of the culture. Parents, it is especially important that you spend time discipling and shaping your children. It is especially important that you spend time pouring into your children, developing within them a biblical framework and worldview that does not mean that they will always obey it, but you're, you're laying a foundation for them and you have to do it. If you don't do it, I promise you the world will. TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, Disney, they'll do it. They will shape the way your children think. They are shaping the way your children think. They're shaping the way you think as well. There is a reason that Nebuchadnezzar picked young people for this program, moldable, pliable, that he might train them, right? That they would never depart from his ways. So parents, do not forfeit the responsibility that God has given you to disciple and to train your children. Do not forfeit, don't don't say, well, that's the church's responsibility, That's the Grace Kids teacher's responsibility. That's the pastor's. That's the youth leader's responsibility. If you came to church every week and you were here, anytime our doors were open, you might spend a total of one to three hours in the church building. Take away all the hours in the week that are are, uh, spent sleeping. That leaves you with about 110 hours left for your children and you to be molded and shaped. So you really believe that one to three hours a week is going to, suddenly re-disciple your, your children, you have a better opportunity in your home to do what we cannot do here at church. It's your responsibility. We wanna come alongside you and aid you in that process, but it is the parent's responsibility to disciple and to shape their children. And so I would ask you, how are you using the time that you have to build a firm foundation, to build and develop a Christian worldview for your children because they are being shaped daily? as are you. Before we move on, I want to point out one last thing. Notice that King Nebuchadnezzar first isolated these young men before indoctrinating indoctrinating them. He he took them away from uh, the, the land of Jerusalem. He took them away from the temple. He took them away from the teaching. He took them away from corporate worship. 
when you are isolated from the faith community, when you are away from the corporate body, don't be surprised when you begin to adopt the ideas of the culture. We are here to stir each other up to, to, to love and good works, and we're here to, to keep each other grounded in sound doctrine. With all this cultural indoctrination that we experience each day, the imminent question for the church is this. Will we simply go along to get along? Will we assimilate? Will we join the crowd? Or will we stand firm in our convictions? That brings us to our second point today. Resolve not to compromise. Resolve not to compromise. Look at verse 8. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear the Lord my king, or I fear my Lord the king, who assigned your food and your drink. For why should he see that you were in worse condition than the youths who are of your own age? So you would endanger my head with the king. Then Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had assigned over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, test your servants for 10 days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance and the appearance of the youths who eat the king's food be observed by you and deal with your servants according to what you see. So he listened to them in this matter and tested them for 10 days. At the end of 10 days, it was seen that they were better in appearance and fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate the king's food. So the steward took away their food and the wine they they were to drink and gave them vegetables. As I mentioned earlier, along with the education that Daniel and his peers would have received, they also received one added benefit three square meals at the table straight from the king's kitchen each day. Don't don't underestimate how great of a privilege that is that these foreigners in a new land ate better than most of the citizens of Babylon. They, They had it good. They had it easy. They had great food, great wine, and and many of them were just loving it. Now, there's, a, there's intention behind this for Nebuchadnezzar. Again, he wants, to, he wants these young men to understand all the good things in your life come from me. Every good that you have, it comes from me. Most would jump at the opportunity to partake in such delicacies. Daniel, however, drew a line in the sand. Look at verse 8. Daniel resolved. He resolved that he would not defile, he would not pollute himself with the king's food or with the king's wine. This word resolved has the the connotation of making up his mind beforehand. Before he was ever faced with the situation, he said, I'm not doing it. I will not go that far. Here's my line in the sand. I will not cross it. And it's interesting that this was the place where he chose to draw the line. He participated in his education. He showed up to class. He received the new name. And yet here, he drew the line at the king's table. Well, why? Scholars have offered several possible reasons. Some say it's because the food that he was offered was unclean according to Levitical law. That that he would not pollute himself. He would not defile, defile himself and go against old covenant law. And that is certainly very plausible. Although Hosea seems to make the argument that any food eaten in captivity is unclean. There's hardly a way for Daniel to escape eating unclean food in captivity. Some have offered offered the suggestion that maybe it was because this food and this wine was dedicated to to pagan gods. In in the preparation, it was dedicated, it was offered to idols uh, before it was given to the young men. And therefore, uh, uh, Daniel said, I I don't want to participate in that. Again, that's possible, but you would have to think, so would the vegetables be offered to foreign gods before they were given to him as well, unless he picked them himself. Maybe Daniel saw eating the king's food as an act of indulgence and fellowship with the king that would simply cause him to get just a little too comfortable in Babylon. Right? Think about this. 
Feasting in the, in the scriptures is often uh, symbolized as it's a sign of joy and celebration. So to feast is like, oh, I, I'm, I'm content here. I'm happy here. Fasting, on the other hand, is a sign of mourning, a sign of longing. And it could be that Daniel was simply saying, I'm not at home here. All these other people, they can have a real good time eating this really good food, but I'm not at home here. And I refuse to participate in the table of the king. It could be that Daniel wanted the king himself to know that it was not his food that would make Daniel prosper, but it was God alone. Whatever his motive, Daniel clearly saw that participation in the delicacies of the king's table would not at all honor God. But notice how he deals with this challenge, the way he approaches his boss. He doesn't throw a fit. He doesn't post a Facebook rant complaining about every little detail. He boldly, boldly, yet humbly approached his boss, and he made his request known. Please let me abstain from the king's food. And by God's grace, God granted him favor. Literally, God granted him steadfast love and mercy in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. Here, where we we see that the chief of the eunuchs seems to receive this young man coming to him saying, I've got conscience issues with this and I, I can't go that far. He seems to understand and to sympathize. And yet the chief of the eunuchs out of fear of his own life can't grant Daniel the request that he's asking for. He, he says, I can't, pre- I can't present you to the king malnourished. I can't do it. I'll die. He'll take my own head. And so the chief of the eunuchs uh, rejects Daniel's offer. Note Daniel's persistence, though. He's not deterred. He seeks out another man, the the steward who is put in charge of his care. He seeks out another man who is is over he and his friends, and he, he makes the request again, please give us vegetables, please give us water, that we might not participate in the king's table. There may have been some incentive in the steward who was caring for him that he might have thought, ooh, for the next 10 days, I get to eat this good food and I can just trade out some vegetables for Daniel and their friends and nobody else ever has to know. We don't know why it was that the steward agreed to it other than God granting favor, but the steward does agree. We see here Daniel's faith. He firmly believes that the rejection of the king's food will not serve to be a detriment to his health, not in the least bit. He knows that God will cause him to prosper. And that's exactly what happens. After 10 days, he's shown to be correct. He and Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah are all stronger and healthier, literally fatter in flesh, than those who had the best food in all the land. There's been many applications of this passage. You've probably heard of the Daniel fast. You may have participated in the Daniel fast. I have no qualms if you've done that. But the point of their success was not attributed to their diet, but to God. That's the reason that these young men found success. The whole point is that God prospered them despite their diet of literally, the text says seeds. That's what they're eating, seeds and water. And yet they prospered. Daniel's faith and his convictions combined to set up a scenario in which God would be glorified in the prospering of these young men in exile, which means that King Nebuchadnezzar could not take credit for their prosperity. He couldn't do it. You think of of Abraham. Early in the, the book of Genesis, Abraham meets the king of Sodom. And the king of Sodom wants to pay him uh, tribute. He wants to give him a bunch of money. And Abraham says, I won't take any of that, lest you said that you made Abraham rich. I believe that's what's going on with Daniel. I I won't take your food, lest you say, I made Daniel prosper. Look at the education that I gave him. Look at the food I gave him. I caused his prosperity. Daniel wants all to know that it is God who has caused his prosperity. So how does this apply to us? Well, first, we ought to see the importance of voicing our Christian convictions as soon as possible. Look at at Daniel. He doesn't wait. He doesn't delay. He goes directly to the chief 
this is a high up official. This is like a top White House, a top Pentagon aide. He's a lowly intern and he's going to them saying, I got these convictions and I just need you to know them. I need you to know. He doesn't wait on this. It's tempting to hide our faith in the public square, to wait until the right time to speak of our faith. Let me tell you, the longer you wait, the harder it gets to speak up. The longer you wait, the harder it gets to speak up. Sinclair Ferguson says, always take the first opportunity to show yourself a decided Christian. It may not be easy, but the fact of the matter is that no, easy, no easier opportunity will present itself. The second opportunity is always more difficult if the first has been refused. I would encourage you to do that. And listen, I have to eat my own cooking here. We need to do that with our neighbors, with our coworkers, friends at school, family. Take the first opportunity to show yourself, hey, I'm a Christian, just so you know. So That way it's not awkward when you bring it up later in conversation. Second thing, I think we need to think clearly about the areas in which we're most vulnerable to compromise. Think about those areas in which you are tempted to compromise on Christian conviction. This could apply broadly. There's a number of ways we could uh, apply this concept. But, But as you occupy and inhabit a world that doesn't value the things that you value as a Christian, there will be times when it's like, well, I'll just blend in here. It's just a little easier to blend in and not be a weirdo. That would be easier. Think about in terms of dress. You know, everybody else wears this. Why can't I wear it? Entertainment. Everybody else is watching this. They're, they're, they're listening to this music. I need to fit in, right? I need to fit in with my friends. I, need, I, can't, I can't not have something to say when they talk about that new album. Jokes, right? Inappropriate jokes. Oh, they, think I'm, they would think I'm a stick in the mud if I didn't laugh at that joke when they made it. Questions of ethics? They'll think I'm a bigot if I don't agree with them on this. If I, if I, don't, if I don't agree with their viewpoint on this issue, this issue, this issue, they'll call me a bigot. I'll be ostracized. There's all kinds of areas where it's so tempting because we don't like friction. We don't like friction with the culture. It's so tempting to say, you know what, then I'll just join the way you're going. Then there's no friction. But Christian, you have been called to live in the world, yes, but not of it. You have, called to, you have been called to live a holy, holy means set apart, distinctly Christian life. And so I'd ask you, is that what people see when they look at you? Do they know, do they see that you are distinctly, possibly weirdly, Christian, or do you just act like everybody else? Don't underestimate how difficult it will be to stand firm in your convictions. It will not get easier in America. The trend is only that it will get harder. But you must resolve ahead of time that you will not compromise. If you do, you'll find that reward awaits the faithful. And that's our third and final point for today. Reward awaits the faithful. Look now in Daniel 1, verse 17. As for these four youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. At the end of the time when the king had commanded that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king spoke with them. And among all of them, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore, they stood before the king. And in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters that were in all his kingdom. And Daniel was there until the first year of King Cyrus. We see here that God rewards Daniel's faithfulness by granting him supernatural wisdom. Supernatural wisdom in the court of the king. 
This does not come from Nebuchadnezzar's education. This does, not, this does not come from the University of Babylon. It does not come from the professors or all of the, the teachers, assistants, or the tutors. This wisdom, supernatural wisdom, comes from God. This should not come as a surprise. Proverbs 9, verse 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. You can't even begin to be wise. It's not, just, it's not just that Daniel had a different degree of wisdom compared to the magicians and the emperors. His wisdom was different in kind. It was different in category. It was a unique wisdom that comes from God himself. Proverbs twenty two twenty nine seems to predict what Daniel is doing right here. Do you see a man skillful in his work? He will stand before kings. He will not stand before obscure men. This is exactly what happens to Daniel and company. They find, them sta- stand, they find themselves standing before the most powerful man in the world, called into the king's palace. Daniel and his, refer- Daniel and his friends might remind you of uh, Joseph in the court of Pharaoh speaking truth to power, guiding the events of human history as he has risen to power. Just as God used Joseph, God will use these young men in the court of Gentile kings to bring glory to his great name, to to, uh, carefully watch and observe and speak into global political events for God's glory. Daniel himself actually outlast King Nebuchadnezzar and his successors and is still found serving in the court of the king as a new nation, the nation of Persia, and a new king, the King Cyrus, rise to power. Daniel's span of service spans the entire length of the exile. It, as, as king, this is a microcosm of God's kingdom here. As Nebuchadnezzar rises and falls, Daniel's still there. As Belshazzar, Nebuchadnezzar's son, rises and falls, Daniel's still there. As King Cyrus comes into power, Daniel is still there, just as God's kingdom will remain eternally as every other kingdom rises to power and then falls from power. Here, these young men stand, having faithfully endured one test with many still to come. No doubt that their uncompromising faith in the matter of the king's food was now strengthened their resolve for many trials that would soon come. The trial of the fiery furnace, the trial of the lion's den, this trial of the king's food was simply preparation for those coming events. As we look at the lives of Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, I can't help but think of all the other nameless men that accompanied accompanied these young men to Babylon. All those young men, we have no indication that any other ever followed the lead of Daniel. The majority of the Hebrew boys caved and they chose to partake in the delicacies of the king. It's easy as we read the Bible to identify with the heroes of the faith We read a book like Daniel and we hear, dare to be a Daniel, be like Daniel. We'd all love to believe that we'd be like Daniel if we were put in the same situation. Uncompromising in the face of temptation, standing bold to earthly powers. We love to think that we do that, don't we? The truth is, we're all far more like the rest of the Hebrew boys than Daniel and his three friends. We've compromised more times than we can count. We have given in more times than we can number. We have not held firm to our convictions because we wanted to be liked and accepted by the people around us. We're compromisers. So the question is, is there any hope for compromisers? And the answer is yes, there is hope. Because the fulfillment of Daniel's example is not primarily found in us, but in Jesus Christ. Jesus, just as Daniel was taken into captivity, into a foreign land, living in a strange land, so was Jesus. You're talking about the Son of God who ever existed with the Father in heaven, 
That was his home. That was his abode. And yet he left it to come to a strange, scary place that we had just entirely jacked up. That was Jesus, an exile in a foreign land, in a hostile world. Daniel was offered delicacies from the king's table. Jesus was offered delicacies straight from Satan's table. He was offered more than just bread. He was, he was offered every kingdom in the world as he stood toe to toe with the prince of the power of the air, with the, with the king of darkness standing there in the wilderness. Jesus stood toe to toe with him and he was offered everything. Everything, Jesus, you can have it all if you would simply bow down and worship me. And yet Jesus said, I will not do it. Jesus is the better Daniel, the one who never compromised in the face of temptation, even though you and I consistently do it every day. He rejected the seductive offers of Satan, choosing instead to suffer and die for compromisers like you and me. And he was vindicated. Because he was faithful, he was vindicated and God raised him from the dead that he might ascend to the right hand of the father and even now he reigns over all earthly kingdoms. Stephen read earlier, Psalm chapter two. Just think about this. When you look at kingdoms and you're scared by them, by North Korea and Iran and Russia and China, think about this. He says, the Lord holds those rulers in derision. He sits in heaven and he laughs. This is the king that we serve. He was faithful and so he has ascended to the right hand of the father. Faithful, a faithful high priest, a faithful high priest for compromisers, for weak people like you and like me. And so, yes, we wanna be faithful, we, we do. But more than that, I want you to believe in the one who was faithful in your place. I want you to look to him and see him as your righteousness and understand that he will empower you. As culture shifts, as culture declines, he will empower you to remain faithful if you keep looking to him. The worst thing that could ever happen to you, which is uh, eternal death, damnation, those things have already happened to you in Christ Jesus. You've been crucified with Christ. There is literally nothing worse that could happen. So you can be free to serve God without fear and without compromise for all your days. Let's pray. Father, we admit that we fear. We're prone to panic. We're prone to compromise, all of us. Maybe even last night, this morning, compromised in some way. We sinned against you. And our only hope is that Jesus was not a compromiser, is that he was found faithful, and that he came to rescue compromisers like us. Lord, we want to be found faithful. We want to follow you, but we need your empowering grace to do it because it is hard. We pray, Lord, whatever you send our way, whether you send social ostracization or uh, physical persecution, we pray, Lord, that you would help us stand firm with holy resolve, no matter the consequences. Father, help us to filter everything that's going on around us through the lens of scripture, that we might be firm, unwavering, a tree planted by streams of water. We pray that would be the case for everyone in this room this morning. We pray this in Christ's name.